Okay, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My dear friends, Allah bless you all. After a, after quite a long pause, we resume. Okay, let's start. Uh, Al-Fatiha. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad salatan tufrihuhu tusaiduhu turdihi wajzihi biha anna ma huwa ahluhu ya arhamar rahimin wa alihi wa sallim Allahumma zidna wa la tanqusna wa akrimna wa la tuhinna wa a'tina wa la tahrimna wa athirna wa la tu'thir alayna وَأَرْضِنَا وَرْضَعَنَّا يَا كَرِيمٌ So, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Allah bless us all with the tremendous month of Ramadan and all of its gifts and now we hope to continue to take what we got from through Ramadan and you know continue with it for the rest of the year so we ask Allah to accept that month from us and whatever we were able to do and let's now look at some questions okay, so we have some questions here Allah, uh, let's have a look. <clears throat> so the first question is, how is spiritual excellence realized in places of obvious corruption? It's easier than you think, you know, because uh, most people think... <clears throat> <clears throat> Most people think that um, you have to just be shut off away from everything that's um, that's bad in order to benefit from the teachings of the Deen and you know in terms, especially in terms of the spirituality. That's not necessarily correct. Yes, avoiding uh, things that are harmful and detrimental to you is always the default state that you should do. It's like having a bucket. You want to fill it with water, and but. You know, you've dr drilled a hole in the bottom. <laughs> There's two, three holes, and so <coughs> usually it's a case of no matter how much you fill it, it's gonna get emptied. So, you know, yes, avoiding things like this. But there's also another side of it, which is, uh, and there's a general principle in Islam: al uh, ajru ala qadr al mashaqqa. The reward you get is equivalent to the difficulty you endure whilst doing a particular action. So someone who, for example, someone, you'll have to excuse this cough I've got, <coughs> someone who goes to perform the Hajj and, you know, he's uh, having to walk and, you know, endure the difficulties of walking in the heat, maybe having other people with him and looking after them and taking care of things whilst he's doing the Hajj, a very difficult physical exertion uh, for him. He's going to have, you know, a lot of reward compared to someone who doesn't go through that difficulty. He just sits in a nice air-conditioned vehicle and he's taken from one place to another and he just steps off to throw the stones at the Jamarat, for example. And, and the reward of both groups is not the same. Both types of people. Uh, what we do uh, say here is that some people, because of the depth of their sincerity and their general closeness to Allah, may have a physically easier Hajj but more reward. And that's Dalika Fadlullahi Yu'tihi Man Yasha. That's the Fadl of Allah, the generosity of Allah. He gives it to whoever He wants. So that's not our concern. But, uh, but what we learn from this is that whenever there's difficulty and there's effort from the slave, Allah gives more right so in a place where there's obvious corruption for example if you if you're in um, you know there's this hadith about I forgot the exact wording you'll have to excuse me it's it's in uh, Sahih al-Bukhari uh, the, 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 there's one which is مثل الذي يذكر ربه والذي لا يذكر كمثل الحي والميت the similitude of someone who remembers his lord and someone who doesn't is like the living and the dead and and then there's another wording which I was initially thinking of um, uh, the, the, the rough meaning is that whoever remembers Allah when other people are heedless is like someone who continues to fight in a battle when others have run away 
Meaning, when everyone else is turning away from Allah, you turn to Allah. Right? And the reward that you get in that situation and the closeness that you'll gain, you know, will be much more than <coughs> than uh, <coughs> than your equivalent efforts at a time where other people are making dhikr as well. So, for example, you know, um, you go to a shopping center and most people are there for the dunya. Most people are there to get, you know, a new set of trainers or, you know, uh, a new phone or whatever they, they've gone to buy. And their minds are far from God, even believers, right? They're, you know, but and then there's music blasting in the background, or whatever. You go there for a particular purpose, you're going to buy a book, right? For example, keep your tongue busy. La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sallim, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sallim. When you engage with Allah, when you make remember Allah or make dua or dhikr in situations like this, when everyone else is heedless, it's like you stand out. You know, like if you look up in the sky and the moon stands out compared to everything else. It's probably like that when the angels are looking <laughs> looking down at earth. Uh, such places, such places, you know, would be like, if, if you're talking about lighting, they'd be like a black hole. <laughs> and in the middle of it, there's a person sh shining bright. That's what you want. So even when there's, uh, when there's places of, uh, when you're in a place where there is corruption, whatever, um, the first thing is obviously avoid it yourself as much as you can. If you do slip, then we have the gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called Tawbah. Turn back to Allah, ask His forgiveness and realign yourself with Him. So <coughs> that's the first thing to do. <coughs> the second thing is keep busy with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as I just talked about. And the third thing is hate those factors, hate those elements uh, of corruption that surround you in your heart and wish well for people. This is how the Prophet was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is, you know, uh, وَوَضَعْنَا عَنْكَ وزرك. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Messenger of Allah, did we not? Uh, it's a continuation of a, uh, of a question. So, أَلَمْ نَشْرَحْ لَكَ صَدْرَكَ So, he said, did we not lift your burden from you? What is this burden? So the scholars of Tafsir talk about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam seeing his people and seeing his society, these people having turned away from God and worshipping idols and their, all the other superstitions that they had. <coughs> and he really wanted to, to guide them to something better, to Islam, well, to, to the worship of one God, Tawheed. And but he didn't know the way and the means to do it. Oma kunta tadri mal imanu mal kitabu wal al iman in Surah Shura. And then Allah granted him the Quran. Allah gifted him the guidance of you know the final revelation. And then he was able to guide people. This is the strongest interpretation of the also of the verse. Wa wajadaka dalan fahada. He he compared him. Um, he's not saying he was misguided hashahu sallallahu alaihi wasallam rather he's comparing the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in his desire to wanting to guide uh, his people yet not knowing how to to someone who wants to get to a destination but doesn't know how to uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala allah blessed him with that so this is it wish well for people wish well for people and then the fourth and you know, possibly the most important one is be like the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This doesn't necessarily mean dressing like him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and <clears throat> because there are there are wider elements to this, and the the biggest elements of the Sunnah are the, the akhlaq. Obviously, the Sunnah is in your in your worship, but then there's the akhlaq and how to call people. Uh, and in our times, you know, with the world as it is, morality, have high morals, don't accept injustice, don't accept, you know, unethical matters, accept only things that are morally high, uh, because that's the way of the prophets, alayhi salatu wasalam. So, you know, embody the character of the prophets, the the value of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wasalam, his values, and live like that, and... 
despite whatever <clears throat> may be going on around you in the world, what you'll find is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will keep benefiting you through your application of the sunnah, through this remembrance, through shunning uh, the values and the practices that are immoral and, and through hating them in your heart. Right, hating them in your heart mean, meaning that this thing is not good it's not good for me, it's not good for anyone else we don't like it, Allah doesn't approve of it but someone who's stuck in it or someone who's, someone who's doing it, who's even embracing it, then we look at them and say, you know what, this is something that I wish, I would wish for you to not be affected by, right, or to not be embroiled in, and that's that's basically it, right and, uh, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, okay so, all right, we've got a question. If you have any questions, uh, just uh, <coughs> um, type them in the chat and let's see. All right, alaikum salam. I am interested in, in interested in somebody for marriage. How exactly do I do istikhara? How do I formulate it? Okay, so let's do this once more with. Clarity and hopefully with the last time, although I doubt it. As long as there's people out there wanting to get married, there'll be questions on istikhara. Okay, istikhara is very simple. Istikhara is you're asking Allah to make the best thing happen. Yeah? To choose the best and to make the best happen. That's the first and most important part of it. Uh, secondly, find out as much as you can about the person. Right? So you don't do the istikhara immediately. Um, you could do an istikhara on whether you should consider the person, fair enough, but find out uh, as much as you can about the person, speak to them, you know, what they're like, what their family is like, all that, all that stuff. And then once you've done that, you pray a salatul istikhara. And you don't need any specific uh, wording or anything like that. You you can do it, with, although it's ideal to do it with a, with two sets, uh, two nafil prayers, but you can even do it after a fard or a sunnah prayer. Right, and you just raise your hands and you read the dua. Allahumma ni astakhiru kabi ilmika wa astakhiru kabi qudratika. So you read the dua, and in it you're asking, Oh Allah, I'm asking you to choose for me through your knowledge and to make things happen through your power. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's it, right? And you're saying, If this is good for me, make it happen. If it's bad for me, turn it away from me and make me happy with that. So that's all, right? And then. You make a decision. So sometimes a person will feel very strongly, yes, this is the right way. So you go for that. Sometimes um, it's not like that. But it's not dependent on a dream. Many people think, I have to pray the istikhara and jump straight into bed so that I can have a dream. No. You know, and uh, yes, sometimes it can be in a dream, sometimes it's not. So you don't worry about that. So how the response will come is once you've made it, you pray the istikhara, follow a path, do a pros and cons, and choose something and follow one of those ways. And uh, if Allah makes it happen easily, smoothly, then great. There's tawfiq in it. Tawfiq meaning it's aligned with Allah's will. So it's good for you. And but if problems start occurring, or you know, if it's marriage and they're saying, Oh, we want to delay until next summer or the summer after, so we can get that flash venue, then <clears throat> that's generally a sign that no, it's not good for you. So you say, Okay, thank you very much, and you you walk off, right? And you know, you, you let the person down. You think, I prayed in this Sikhara, and I don't really feel that it's, uh, it's it'll be positive for me. Nothing wrong with you, but it's just it's just the way it's, it's happened. And just thank them, and then just you know consider something of someone else, and that's basically it. Okay. Right, I'm gonna have a, a policy now with OCD questions, because I've been getting harassed a lot <laughs> on social media. <laughs> All right. Um, All right. I know you can wipe over smooth surfaces to remove najasa. What if the najasa is invisible, like najis water? Like if I w wipe the side of my laptop. Firstly, how is your laptop going to get najasa on it? That's one thing. If it's invisible, then uh, if it's visible, uh, you just wipe over it once. If it's a smooth surface, and if it's gone, if it's disappeared, great. 
right? If it's invisible, you swipe over it three times, done. That's all you need to worry about. You just, just do that and it's fine, right? Don't overthink it. And uh, even the water and the alcohol wipes are all fine. All right. What Islamic places, Madaris and other teachers would you visit in Istanbul? Are there any hidden spots you would recommend students to visit? Um, I've only been to Istanbul once myself. Um, places I would probably go visit some of my teachers there. <laughs> uh, Dr. Hamza Al-Bakri, uh, radiallahu anhu. Uh, there's um, Sheikh Abdurrahman Arjan and uh, Sheikh Ahmed Snowbar. Uh, they're the three teachers who I studied with who are now based in uh, uh, Istanbul. I'd probably go visit them. Other places, um, <coughs> I would go visit um, and pray for uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid II, who's in Bayezid. So if you're in uh, Sultan Ahmed, it's one stop up on the tram. Uh, it's actually walking distance. Uh, where he's buried. Uh, if you're going uphill, he's on the right hand side of the road. His grandfather is there, both righteous men. Um, you pray for them there. Uh, where else would I go? There's the there's the maqam of the, the wali, Aziz Mahmoud Hudai, very famous wali uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, so I'd go to his maqam. Uh, that's on the eastern, eastern side. Um, Uskudar, I believe, yeah. It's been quite a long time since I've been. Um, Sayyidina Ayyub, Abu Ayyub al Ansari, of course, uh, Sultan Muhammad Fatih. They're not secret places, these. I don't know any secret places. Um, and then I'd, I'd like to have a big uh, trip to the bookshops. <laughs> Allah. Yeah. So that's what I would do. All right. Mm. But if there's anyone else who you do know of, anyone righteous and who you can visit and, you know, ask for their du'as, then great, great. Allah, are earnings from, a cigarette, from cigarette shops makruh haram? The shop sells cigarettes as well as smoking products, as uh, which are obviously marijuana. Um, lottery and tickets. Yeah, I think there's gonna, they're likely it's, it's going to be sinful. That income is not going to be halal. Cigarettes are impermissible anyway. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't know what to say about vapes. It comes down to whether it's uh, detrimental to your health or not. If it's not, and you know that that could be fine. But um, all the other stuff that's the bong pipe e pen, which obviously for marijuana. Um, to be honest with you, these sorts of things, selling something like this. Um, it may well be considered assisting someone in committing sins. Um, it's not like um, it's not like selling contraception, for example. Yes, there's a possibility someone could walk in and they're going to use it to go and commit zina. But then there's also likely to be a legitimate use, you know, married couples using it. But in, uh, in the case of these sorts of things that are used for marijuana, then if there is a halal, <laughs> I doubt it. If there is a you know a way of using it in a in a permissible manner, fair enough. But I doubt it. So I think that would be considered sinful. Sinful. The same with lottery tickets. So any income, someone like this, his income is not going to be blessed. It's going to be haram. Uh, if he used, if he put his effort into selling halal things, Allah would give him the equivalent income in a halal way. And, you know, he'd be blessed in that income. As it is, someone like this, it would be, um, yeah, it's, uh, I'm saying haram, but yeah, makru tahriman, which practically speaking is the same as haram. It's just uh, the, the difference on a practical level between makru tahriman and haram for most people is, you know, it's negligible. They're both, it's, uh, in terms of practice and application, it's the same. So someone like this who should make a tawbah and turn away and find another source of income. You know, it's better to sell sweets. Yeah, I guarantee you, you won't go out of business by selling sweets. Right. Allah. Oh, 
is outsourcing call center work, like faking your original ID in front of customer or shadow development halal or not? Um, I don't know what shadow development is. You shouldn't just clarify that. But yes, faking your original ID is lying and that's a sin. So you'd be sinful in that aspect of your job. Um, so it's not something you would want to do. Like it's not something you'd want to do at all. And Allah knows best. All right, let me take a question from here and we'll come back. Allah. <clears throat> so we have a question, maybe a bit late now, but how does faith increase during Ramadan? <clears throat> Well, uh, without going into a theological <laughs> difference, faith, how does faith increase? It's through works. And you can have two people who both enter Islam on the same day, in the same way, through the same proof that they see. And then one person just doesn't nurture his faith, doesn't do as much, as, ma <coughs> as many works. <coughs> And then you have another person who does do more works, right? <clears throat> and they're not going to be the same. Because um, your iman uh, does increase through good deeds. The more you do, the more uh, you benefit, the stronger your certainty becomes. That's what, and so the reason why this happens in, in Ramadan, the devils are locked up. <clears throat> The shayateen are locked up. The ummah as a whole is focused on drawing closer to Allah. It's 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 quite, you know it's a miracle. Honestly, it really is a miracle where people, you know, who have no intention of going to a mosque or no intention of praying or turning to Allah, you know, a week before Ramadan. But in Ramadan, something changes, right? The influence of of the shaitan isn't affecting them in the same way, and they do amazing deeds, literally amazing things, you know. And uh, so through the removal of obstacles and barriers, people can do more and then they benefit more. Right? And this, this, that's basically how it works. So they get rewarded more and that's how uh, their faith increases in Ramadan. They experience an increase in faith because there's an increase in output. <laughs> and this is something that Imam al-Ghazali also talks about that people seem to think that you know how is faith increased and they think oh I learned this proof and then that proof and then another proof on the you know for this th point in theology but that's not how your Iman increases Iman increases there's a base level everyone has well then to increase it you, you require works so that's why he says encourage children to do works and you know not everyone needs to be uh, yes, you should know your, your faith, you should know your creed, what you believe and why you believe it. That's an obligation, right? You should know that. Uh, but then beyond that, you know, for most people, the focus and the goal should be on um, worshipping Allah, right? And drawing closer to Him, uh, learning the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, changing their character. This is where the benefit comes. So when people are doing some aspect of this in Ramadan, they feel that their faith is increased. And that's the secret behind it. Okay. <clears throat> Can we do healer like assuming fake ID is one's own? No, clearly it's it's not, is it? And you're lying if you do that. So forget the healer and uh, just address the issue and don't, and don't lie. And uh, Allah knows best. And you can tell your employers, I don't feel comfortable lying. And, uh, you know, hopefully they'll accommodate. Okay. Um... Seems they added some Ramadan questions after. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Um, Allah, are sins forgiven for the fasting person standing in prayer for the minor or major sins? Okay, this is based on the hadith 
where the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Man qama Ramadana imanan wa ahtisaban ghufira lahu ma taqaddam min dhambih. And there's a similar hadith about Laylatul Qadr and a similar one about and you're fasting in Ramadan where he said all of his previous sins are forgiven. Uh, the ulama generally say for hadith like this, and the hadith about sins being forgiven when you make wudu or when you or you pray your prayers or these sorts of things, they say that the the sins that are automatically forgiven uh, in these situations are the minor sins, and uh, if uh, if a person wants their major sins to be forgiven, they need to repent. They need to make a tawbah. And to be honest with you, a tawbah is you know easy. You turn to Allah and just you just gotta move your heart a bit and say, look. Oh Allah, I'm sorry. I really do mean it. I'm sorry. I wish I hadn't done these things. And if you find that, you know, you're saying this tawbah, but inside you're, you're saying, you're thinking, you know what? Uh, I enjoy doing X, Y, and Z, and I don't intend to stop. I want to keep doing it. Then you need to make a different uh, dua at that point. Now, oh Allah. The, the pleasure and the enjoyment and the sweetness that I derive from those sins, remove it from me, Rabbi. Remove it from me and change it into uh, dislike and loathing and put, put happiness and, and pleasure in obeying you uh, for me. And so you, you, you make that dua and then you make your toba again. You ask Allah, oh Allah, forgive me. I know I've done these things, I've even enjoyed them, but you're forgiving. Please forgive me and change me so I don't want to go back to them. Right? And that's, that's how it's done. And uh, <clears throat> Allah knows best. Allah. Okay. Right. Um, all right. Any more questions? It's a bit thin on the ground today with the questions. All right. Let me take one from you. All right. No more gaming questions, please. I beg you. <laughs> Allah. Will earnings from multiplayer video games, 2D and 3D be permissible? I assume you're saying um, <clears throat> if the content of the game is permissible, you know, there's nothing indecent or lewd or anything going on and you're playing the game or whatever, like, you know, someone's playing Super Smash Brothers in a tournament or whatever and you get some earnings yes it's permissible it's permissible <clears throat> okay Allah Allah so here's one how can one continually magnify one's intention in all one does? So, you can just do a shortcut. Oh Allah, I'm intending anything uh, the righteous would intend or anything your Prophet would want me to intend here. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's one way of doing it. So, intention is something tremendous. In intention is actually the first step in following the sunnah, right? In the Malamalu bin Niyat, the first hadith in Sahih al Bukhari. So uh, you make an intention and make it, you know, the most beneficial intention, which is to please Allah. Right? To draw closer to Allah, to please Allah. That's the broadest intention, the most beneficial intention. So you can just do that and say, Oh Allah, I'm doing this for you. Accept it from me. And you know, and just carry on, you know. Um, so um, there are there are certain works. Uh, Allah reward the authors of those works who th they've laid out a whole list of potential intentions in scenario X, Y, Z in many situations. Excellent books. Um, I believe one of the the Hadrami scholars, um, Al Aydarus, maybe um, he has one. Um, uh, it's just called the Book of Intentions. It's good to get that book and read it once, just to see what kind of things you can intend. And then, if you're in a particular situation and you can't intend something else specifically, great. Uh, but generally, um, you know, it's it's not always practical to have a list of intentions. So you just intend the very best and the highest of them. Um, one of the best things you can do is to learn the intention of learning and studying that Imam Abdullah 
uh, Al Haddad uh, has no way to Ta'alum or Ta'alim or Tazakur or Tazkir or Nafa' or Intifa'. Uh, very, uh, it's an excellent. If you, I'm sure, if you Google it, you'll find it. It's an excellent, um, uh, excellent intention for learning and applying that knowledge and then passing it, passing it on. And uh, you know, uh, just do, just do that, uh, and intend to please Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, to seek His pleasure, to revive the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, to benefit the Muslims if the action is you know, uh, suitable for that intention. And that's the best way, right? And so ideally, uh, uh, a few short uh, intentions that you have ready in your mind that you can apply to every situation. Oh Allah, just to please you, uh, to worship you, to uh, follow the sunnah of your Prophet, to revive the sunnah, and, you know, to to bring iman to people's hearts or something like that and uh, they they'll be the best and broadest of intentions and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best Allah <clears throat> okay what have you got here um I am currently considering making Hijra to a more Islamic country with benefits such as having a day off on Fridays to pray Juma, less indecency, easier to act upon religion in general. Having told by certain people that oh, it's, just, yeah, it's all the same out there. However, if there are such religious benefits out there, is it better to migrate than to stay put? Excellent question. Um, okay, Hijra is, you know, the world we live in is, you know, it has its complexities, right? And in some situations, hijra is brilliant for people, and in some situations, it's better to remain where you are. Firstly, practical, practically, it's not possible for everyone to leave the West, for example, and go um, elsewhere. Um, practically, you know, where would you go? You know, most of the time when people, you know, I've tried living in Muslim countries and it's difficult. It's difficult just getting the residency, you know, all of these sorts of things. If you have a fair bit of money behind, you know, behind you where you can buy a property or something like that, it is made easier. You know, Alhamdulillah, Allah does facilitate it uh, in that way. But for a lot of people, it's not easy. It's not, you know, it's not um, uh, something that uh, they can manage without a great deal of difficulty. So, uh, let's look at the, you know, so, some of the aspects. The Muslim world, um, believe it or not, yes, there are plenty of pros, but um, less indecency. Like, if you're going somewhere, where the, in, I, I, I recently went to Egypt, and uh, we went to a village, like, my, like about three hours away from Cairo, and uh, the souk and it's where one of the the awliya is buried uh, um, him and his brother actually but a sheikh ibrahim at the souki and we went in and i got the vibe the feeling that you get in that you i'd get in the <coughs> in the outskirts of damascus and i said to my friend if i was ever to run away and leave civilization i'd want to come to a place like this and uh, you know just <laughs> but even then it's not like backwards you know you have you have internet you have these sorts of things so um there are there are so many b beautiful places like this but i assume many people who do go to a muslim country will probably want to live near a city or you know connected to it um so the, the problem with a lot of muslim c uh, countries is um it's not always easy in the same sense to practice your deen um uh, a lot of the the governments in this, you know, they don't make it easy for people. Um, it's very unfortunate. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying every Muslim country is like this. I I obviously haven't been to all of them, um, but you know, I mean, I'm sure. For example, in Southeast Asia, you know, for example, there are p places where many people move to, and their deen thrives. So, uh, you know, it'd be it'd be on whoever wants to do this, you know, to make the the relevant re you know, uh, to do the relevant research. Um, so. But if you can find a place where you can practice your deen and you know and you can be safe from a lot of the temptations that, that are out there then you know excellent excellent right and Allah bless that 
Um, having said that, even in the West, there are challenges, and let's be honest, the challenges are increasing. Um, uh, but there is a certain degree of religious freedom that the individual has, right? Communities is, is a more complicated matter, but the individual does have a certain degree of religious freedom in some places in the West that you won't get even in the Muslim world. So, um, so let's going back to the beginning. Um, if someone does want to move to a Muslim country, Ahlan or Sahlan, and I pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitates it for you. And just consider your options and, you know, look around, uh, look where you could be, you know, comfortable. Because there's no point going there and, you know, having your family be so uncomfortable that they hate the Muslim country and they hate the reason why, you know, you've gone there. And then only for them to want to come back to the West later. Um, you know, it's a one-time thing, isn't it? If you make a hijrah, you make it and you stay. You know that that's the best way. So yeah, do you know? Do consider some people consider Turkey, some people consider Morocco, some people consider you know, some of the Gulf countries, and like I said, some people have moved further, further east, and you know, whatever Allah facilitates. You know, um, if if you can practice your deen in in in, in a way where you know your your outward practice or your inward morality or that of your children won't be affected, then you know Allah give you every success. So that's great. Um, uh, but as I said, you know, sometimes, sometimes people uh, try to push this onto people in the West. I think that's the point I was making earlier in the roundabout way. That it's not practical for everyone. It's something, you know, the the ability to perform a hijrah is a blessing. You know, a few people, you know, uh, get, and um, not everyone can do so, right? But if you are one of those people and you want to do it, Allah facilitate it for you. And and then there are others, you know, Alhamdulillah, um, I was speaking to my friend the other day, Sheikh Tabrez Aldham, we were, dis- we were discussing this very issue, and uh, and I said to him that, you know, uh, well, you know, the, the reason why I'm sit- uh, sat here, that was my intention, <laughs> you know, when I came back from the Muslim world, you know, to, to teach people, to teach people their deen, so, you know, uh, learn a bit of your deen and then make that intention to be able to help people uh, stay firm on, on the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and inshallah ta'ala you'll be rewarded for that and Allah will give you ease and tawfiq okay um, right let me see uh, but as for is it all the same out there not necessarily. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there are places where you could go, and it's you know 80 uh, percent Western. <laughs> but even in countries like that or places like that, there usually is a, a deeper undercurrent of Islamic values. Uh, but not everywhere. You know, you have to look. But no, it's not all the same. It's not all the same. Especially if you go with a sincere intention, it's not all the same. Um, uh, Allah knows best. Can I earn a living with trading currency? Um, uh, some of the ulama say no, you shouldn't. You shouldn't. Currency is a means of trade and it shouldn't be a commodity, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah. I was at Imam Shafi's masjid. Yes. Uh, Egypt is beautiful, and uh, yeah, Imam Shafi is mosque. It really is something, isn't it? Yeah, uh, I, I, I did visit it. Alhamdulillah, I've had a very, very beautiful experience there. Um, okay, Waikum Salam. When the moon was split, how would the people observing know the difference between whether it was real or the trick of a magician? Allah. Quite simply because a magician can't do that. <laughs> because the narration says explicitly that, that, you know, there was, I think, Safa, the mountain, it was between, you know, the two the two halves of the moon. And ultimately, that's not the only miracle the Prophet performed, sallallahu alayhi wa We have hundreds 
and in Mecca, you know, just the Quran itself is one of those miracles, right? And for an Arab uh, living in the time of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, anything after hearing the Quran is, is stubbornness. That's all it is. For the person is just stubborn and unwilling to admit that yes, um, this is the truth from God because of the miraculous nature and now a person can go you can study and you can see wow okay this is good speech this is eloquent speech in arabic but the quran completely different level um one of my teachers dr mansoor abu zina he used to say he's a tafsir teacher and he used to say that he knew christians arab christians who read the quran daily well, if he's saying to them, you know, Ya Ahl Kitab, you know, why are you doing this and why are you doing that? Why are they reading it? If they're getting criticized in it, why are they reading it? Because of the pinnacle of its beauty, you know, of Arabic, uh, Arabic eloquence, is manifested in the Quran. So, after, after the Quran, any other thing would just be arrogance, you know, demanding other miracles. But here we have... Um, uh, the case of the the moon being split, it's it was very clear. It was physically very clear. And as for saying, oh, it was a trick of a magician. Well, you can say that with anything. You can say that with practically any visi, you know, visibly ob um, observable miracle. Or you've done something. To, you know, it's just a trick, a sleight of hand. Or you've done something to my sight. And these are the kind of things they they kind of claimed. But um, as for someone who's just open and fair. When they saw that, it would have been enough. And as I said, there are so many other miracles that it's pretty hard to say, well, no, uh, it wasn't real, you know. Allah. How can we know if marriage may not be for us? How long should we try to get married? Um, okay, so it is a challenge for many people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, tests people in various ways and we ask Allah to make it easy for those wanting to get married. Um, sometimes it's hard finding a spouse. Sometimes it's that's the easy part and then dealing with the family struggles. You know, um, <coughs> that's the challenge. So um, generally, um, keep trying. Right, have the intention of following the sunnah and keep trying and sometimes you know it's not easy and sometimes people try once twice three times four times and then you know sometimes people get attached you know to the person they're considering and if it doesn't work it, it causes pain give yourself space right no one says you you know it's it's not like a marathon where you, go, you have to pass the baton on <laughs> you know um you can give yourself some space Right, and give yourself some time, heal, and then consider moving forward. But if you do get to a point where you think it's not going to happen, it, it probably won't happen, or something like this, then uh, you can you can step off the gas if you want, and but never think Allah, you know, um, Allah, Allah can change your life just like that. You know, overnight things can change, and I've seen it happen to people. So don't worry about that and just just say oh Allah if it's good for me uh, for me to be married uh, at this stage I'm saying if if you like that if all oh, is good for me to to be married then you facilitate it for me in the best and easiest way and then you can leave it to Allah if something practically can be done take that step uh, and if, or if something turns up go for it um but yeah like you know uh, choosing not to be married it's not haram right it's not haram uh it's it's, it's it would be mubah you know it's, it's permissible but it's superior to follow the sunni in this regard okay uh Allah Wa will one takbir suffice for the Jummah khutbah and commencing the prayer? Uh, no. Firstly there has to be there, there have to be two khutbahs. So just do a little bit more. You can recite the Fatiha and Surat al Ikhlas in the second khutbah done. 
um, it should be dhikr and just one takbir on its own. I mean, technically, it's dhikr and it may fulfill the minimal obligation, but um, you should probably uh, do a bit more. Allah. Allah, what was this question? Allah, okay, how can we get stability in our Iman? Remember Allah, remember His Messenger, you know, send Send many, many, many salawat on the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's an excellent way to do that. Um, but stability generally will come from learning, uh, spending time with, with scholars. So learning, and then applying that knowledge, and then being around Muslims who have stable deen, and that's what what will give it. Inshallah. Okay, right. Um, Allah bless you all. I'm gonna have to end it here. Um, and for the gaming question, yeah, the same the same answer I said earlier that applies here. Yeah. Okay. Allah bless you all, and we'll continue next week, inshallah. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah.